Hello, and welcome to Superb Women Sundays at 7. I'm your host, Janet Neal, the founder and queen bee at the Superb Woman Incorporated. I'm so happy that you're here with us tonight. And as usual, I have another amazing guest, another wonderful example of a superb woman. For those of you who are new and are thinking, what is a superb woman? Let me take a minute and tell you. A superb woman is a woman who has taken the time to understand who she is. She understands what her values are, what her strengths, her desires, her passions are, and has crafted and is living a life, a very powerful life, as a result. I believe that women can change this world when they understand how powerful they truly are. And the way you get to be powerful is to understand this about yourself and to step in that, into that kind of lifestyle. And I have been so lucky, so grateful to be meeting wonderful examples of superb women all over the place and being introduced to so many of these women and knew that I needed their stories to get out there. So that's why we have our show here. Every week I bring you another example of a superb woman, somebody who has followed their own path and is living an amazing life and giving back to the world as a result. And tonight is no different. Tonight we have Denise Brousseau. Now Denise and I have never met in person, but we were introduced through a mutual friend. And she said, oh, you have to talk to Denise. You need her on your show. And I trusted her. It's Jerry Stengel. You might have seen her. She was on my show earlier. And I trust Jerry, and if Jerry says I need to meet somebody, then I did. And I have had such a wonderful time getting to know Denise, and I'm looking forward to tonight to get to know her even more. So Denise has an interesting background. She comes from a tech world and left that to go and help co-found Springboard, which was is a company that helps um, women get into the into tech businesses and I will let Denise tell a more elegant way of saying that than I just did and then from there she's moved into what she's doing now it's working with leaders to help them become thought leaders something that's really interesting and really needed in this world so welcome Denise to our show thank you so much Janet I love the Queen Bee that's a great that's a great title yes well I figured I, I'm gonna claim it <laughs> Why not? Why not? Definitely. Well, Denise, you know, let's go with this thought leader. I was watching one of your videos on YouTube that you did for the Stanford Business School where you were talking about what is a thought leader. And I'd love you to tell us now, what is a thought leader? How do you define that? The idea for me is thought leaders are really people who are the go-to person in their niche, whether it be in their community, in their company, in their industry, and it's usually someone who is a change maker, someone who introduced something new and then figured out that that change needed to be replicated and scaled much more broadly. So they, I, I find thought leaders in sort of all walks of life, in uh, social services kind of roles as well as in executives and companies, CEOs, and, and this idea that you really understand you need a seat at the table to make change happen, that's what becoming a thought leader is all about. Is how do I get that seat at the table? How do I become that person who shares my ideas broadly and, and really helps others to build on my ideas? Excellent. Well, I think that you know, leading by example is another way I think you can totally be a thought leader and you are a thought leader yourself. So tell us a little bit about your journey, how you got to, to where you are today. You know, I, I, I always say I have the most eclectic resume on the planet. You know, I do not have one of those straight line resumes. I come from a family of straight line people and I am I'm more crooked. You know, I, I <laughs> definitely I took a lot of different roads and you know, I started my career um out of Wellesley College in thinking maybe I wanted to go to law school. So I tried that out for a little while. Then I went to work for a, a startup and then I came out to California on a business trip when I was, I don't know, my early 20s and I just fell in love with California and came out here and I was a little burned out from a role I had and so I, I tempt and I, I feel like my 20s were all about eliminating 
all the things I never want to do in my career. So you know, I tried a little banking, I tried a lot of different things, and insurance. So I was a temp in a lot of places, and finally stumbled on technology. And so I spent a number of early years of my career shipping software products out the door. And while I loved it, you know, I really scaled my career there. It wasn't my where my heart was. I mean, I love technology, and I will always be a, a geeky girl. And uh, I started a tech company when I was 26. So I mean, I really love that piece, but. Finally, after you know, finally my early 30s, I think I kind of stumbled on my path, and my path is really about working with women leaders, and and I've done that in many, many different different ways. So um, after business school, with some friends, I founded a a group here in the Bay Area called the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs, and I eventually left the tech world and ran that group for a number of years and scaled it to a number of chapters across the United States and had the opportunity to start uh, this Springboard Venture Conference, which was the first conference of its kind for women entrepreneurs. So how can we get women who are doing tech companies, who are doing life science companies, to understand how do you raise big money for your business and that was what that organization was about and and the good news is both of those groups still exist uh, Forum for Women Entrepreneurs now is known as Watermark it's it's based here still in the Bay Area and I'm still on the National Advisory Board of Springboard so that was sort of this middle part of my career was really dedicating my my time my energy my enthusiasm um, to this world of women's entrepreneurship and then uh, I sort of veered into a different direction and I took all this knowledge and expertise I had in those roles and I and I do the work that I do today and it's all about how do you take that journey from leader to thought leader and what I noticed and the reason it, it took sort of a, it was a, a bit of a right turn but it also built on everything that has happened before which is how do you get that seat at the table for women primarily my clients now are women and it's really about that sense of why do we not have more women writing op-eds? You know, why do we not have more women on boards? What can I do to make a difference in that arena? Why are women not being nominated for the best awards here? Why are women not uh, gaining that that expertise that they need to be seen as that go-to leader? So what can I do to help them do that? And how can I help them create movements around their ideas? So that's what's really fun now. So I've been doing this work for about six years now, and uh, I just feel like it's the it's the combination of everything, all the crazy paths I took before sort of took me to this present place. Excellent, excellent. So what are some of the reasons why, those questions that you just asked, why aren't we seeing women writing the, the op-eds? Why aren't we seeing them, you know, with the seat at the table? What, what's your, what are the findings that you have? It's, it's a combination of so many different things. You know, when I started working with women entrepreneurs, we were regularly asked this question. I was, I was frequently in, interviewed by the press, and they would call me, and they would say, you know, you're, you're complaining. I see your website says less than 1% of the venture capital money is going to women, and that's why you started your organization. Well, why are women not getting more money? And, and certainly there are the systemic reasons. Certainly in the early days of venture capital, only venture capital money went to semiconductor companies. Well, mm -hmm. we we're seeing that many women in semiconductors. So certainly there is a pipeline issue, which we've heard for so many years. But I do think it's much more broad than that. And and what we try to do is at, in this organization that I started, it was really to, to overcome three key things. One was education, that we really didn't feel that women understood the process of venture capital. Like, what is the goal here? Why do you do it? What's equity versus debt? Why would you fund your company in that way? And so it was really an education process around how to scale a really big business. Mm -hmm. The second piece was about connection. So it was all this access to the resource providers that they needed, whether it be bankers, lawyers, accountants. So you know that's such a broad thing for everybody. Do you have the network that's going to get you to those tables? Do you have the network that's going to give you the advice and the counsel you need? So that second piece is really critical, thinking as for whatever you're doing. What's your Rolodex like? Do you have the people who've done it before? And then the third is connections directly with people who are exactly in your path. So we were always trying to bring together women entrepreneurs with other women entrepreneurs who are further along. You know, you don't have to be much further along to be able to help another person. So we were all, we were often creating groups to bring these women together with each other, but also trying to give them the role models. You know, here's some women who've taken their company public. Not that there were many of them, but it was those three things. You know, can we build their network of each other? Can we build the connections? And then can we really understand how do you do this and 
and what's the point? You know, what's what's in it for you, and what's in it for your investors? So we, I think it's the same thing now. You know, why do women not get at the table? I think many of them don't know that they could, that how to get there. I think that's a key piece. They don't have the Rolodex. They don't have the network. And third, I think they don't have the role models. And so it continues to be my work to to make those introductions, to help people understand how you get to those tables. And, and of course, we also need a little courage. Uh, you know, we all have... This, as one of my clients calls it, we have that itty bitty shitty committee in our brain. You know, that is long. <laughs> and I love that line when she said that. You know, it's that 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 constant voice that says whatever it says. You know, the bar keeps getting raised in your head. Mm -hmm. I'm never good enough. I need another degree. You know, I'm, it's not within my religion. My culture tells me not to. There's a lot of stories we tell ourselves, and a lot of fear that we don't have the most original idea or we don't have anything new to say or whatever. There's a ton of voices. So I think it's also about courage and it's about building yourself the support to, to, to keep coming to the, to, the, uh, to the next step and being willing to take it. Absolutely. Well, how did you, at 26, start a tech company? How, you know, how, what even led you to, to think I mean, what role models did you have in order to do something like this? It's an interesting question, and I think of it more as a happenstance than a, I decided when I was some age that I was going to go start a company. What actually happened was I was working for a startup that was a voicemail company. We were funded by a big uh, multinational, and it was the early days of voicemail, and the company went through lots of employees and crashed in a year. So here I am, I'm sort of employee number 11, we went up to 90, we went to 25, we went up to 90, we crashed in a year. So it was like, you know, the good roller coaster of an early stage startup. And and during that whole time I had this Macintosh computer on my desk and I fell in love with this little Mac and I just thought, this is the coolest thing ever. And I started learning everything I could learn, I read every book, I went to every conference, I hired all these people to teach me the Mac and then when the company closed, everybody knew me as this Mac girl. You know, I was teaching Mac classes during lunch and after work, and it was all just for fun because I thought this thing was so cool. And what, was, what was your job responsibility? Uh, well, I started because um, I had temping for a while. This was my first full-time job after I moved to California, and so I came in as an assistant to the head of marketing with the expectation that when they started the marketing department, I would be the first hire. And so it was three months as an administrative assistant, and then I was the first marketing person. So I did market. That was my first tech marketing role, and that's where I ended up with my career. But I, I started this business because when the company closed, all these people kept calling me. And they kept saying, hey, Denise, do you know how you know all this about Macs? Well, my company wants to buy some Macs, and we don't have anybody who knows anything. Will you come in and help us? And so first I said, oh, sure. And I'd go over after work, and I'd you know set up a network. And finally I realized, um, I could be charging for this. <laughs> so you know that revelation of your first light bulb, like, oh, I have a business here. But it really... So completely clueless. I would just charge a little bit, then I'd charge a little more, then I'd charge a little more, and people kept paying me. So I would do a Macintosh. I'd set up networks. I'd help people source like what was the right Mac, and then I did a lot of training on all the software. And I ran that business on weekends and evenings for four years, and I made more money doing that than I ever made in my tech job at, <laughs> in software companies, which I always thought was really funny. But I, I also was at that moment of looking in my early career going, this is I do this because I love it. You know, and shouldn't mm -hmm. everybody be starting a company because it's something they love to do, mm -hmm. and because it's fun and it's something I look forward to doing? That's that's to me is a really good time to start a company is when you somebody's willing to pay you to do something you love to do. Right, and I think your example is is a good one and one that um, I have uh, counseled a lot of women to do is to not only to do something that you love but to do it part time while you have another job. Oh yes. Oh yeah, and I'll tell you, my father was always very thrilled by that. <laughs> you know, he was he was much more risk averse, and he was one of my key advisors. And he was he was always very nervous for me, thinking that I might go quit my day job and go do that. But you know, when I finally broke through and I was making more money doing that, I think he was a little more surprised than anything. And you know, I didn't know how to market, I didn't know how to run a business, I didn't really know what I was doing. But I was in a hot area, and I had an expertise that nobody had. And I think that is, of course. Find your niche, which is what I do today, is help people find their niche. Right. It hasn't changed a lot. Yeah. So who else has helped you on your path? Who besides your father giving you that advice? Who else has been influential? Yeah. 
been such a journey when you I'm always amazed when women say they don't have mentors because I've had so many of them there's been so many people who've reached out that helping hand to me and I, I would say that probably recently the most influential person is a woman named Sam Horn uh, Sam is the she runs a company called the Intrigue Agency. I don't know if you've ever, she's written a number of books. Uh, she, one of them is called Pop, which I love. It's all about how to pop your ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. And she, she's actually got a new book coming out called Got Your Attention that's coming out in March. And it's all about how to, how to keep and gain people's attention for your, your point of view or your ideas or your business. Anyway, Sam came into my life maybe 10, 15 years ago now and pretty quickly saw that I really loved to speak and sort of took me under her wing and she said to me, you know Denise, um, they pay speakers. And it was really one of those funny moments because I had been speaking for free for years and years and years uh, in various roles that I had and I loved it. But it was the first time I realized that I could make a business from that. So that was one thing she did to really influence me. Um, others, you know, she would invite me. She does these weekend uh, workshops on how to be a speaker, how to write a book, and so she invited me to a number of those over the years. And and then she started a support group, a mastermind for women speakers and authors, and she invited me to be part of that. And that is actually, I would give that group the credit for me actually writing my first book because seeing them, one of them's written nine books, one's written six books, you know, you start to see, oh, this is normal. Of course I can do this because, again, those role models. And so she was has been my role model. She's the one who kind of kicks me kindly when I am not moving in the right direction and pushes me back on track but she also inspires me and she motivates me which is a which we need we all need those people around us absolutely absolutely and I just want to take a minute to um, note your book which is called ready to be a thought leader and it's available on Amazon and at the end of this on YouTube you will see a slide that will have a picture of the book and more information on how to um, get a hold of Denise if you have other questions so I think that's great. Um, a role model, somebody, a mentor, and and I think sometimes um, people get confused by that term mentor. That they think it's like this formal um, situation, um, but really, you know, somebody who who really gives you good advice is is a mentor. And it sounds like Sam was one that that helped you um, with some pretty good advice along the way. Yeah, is there I think. Anything else? The difference between these micro mentors who kind of come in your life, maybe you have lunch with somebody and they push you in a new direction, and, and these what I call Uber mentors, somebody who can be all things to you. And I think Uber mentors are really, really unique. I mean, they are more like unicorns. And so if we spend our whole time looking for them, <laughs> Unicorn, we're going to be constantly disappointed. Whereas if we look for lots of micro mentors, we'll be far more likely to build a micro mentor into someone who can really be a long term relationship that can help you over time. And the more I think that we look for those specific short term connections, the more likely we are to get what we're really looking for. Absolutely. And and that goes to another point that you made. You know, you you're all about connecting women and helping women um, to help each other. And it is my contention um, since I left corporate America that I have seen women who, uh, every woman that I meet that's an entrepreneur, that's out there in business for themselves, wants to help other women. And I just, and it's so important to be able to do that. And, and it sounds like you have found this and are nurturing the same thing. I am absolutely 100% with you on that, and I see it everywhere. I, I, I don't really know about those stories that people say women don't help other women, but I really do believe that it's everywhere if you look for it, but it all starts with an attitude. The attitude isn't take. The attitude is give, and the more I'm helping other people, the more people help me. And, you know, it's not quid pro quo. I, you know, I'm not going to get back from the same person, but I'm going to, if I keep paying it forward, the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs, when we ran this organization, you know, we grew it to seven cities around the country over a couple of years. And what was always true was when we were starting into a new city, it was always about what could we do to help everybody there with nothing, no questions asked. And and that behavior was what we also looked for in a member. We didn't want a member to join who was there with their handout. We wanted, what can they give? And we even had it on our membership application form. What are you bringing to the organization? And I think the more groups are founded with that cause, the more teams are built around that cause, 
it's just going to be a win-win for everyone because we all know something somebody else needs to know. We all have a, a contact or an expertise that we don't even probably see ourselves that even right. if it's resilience, even if it's overcoming adversity, those are skills that many people want to learn from. Absolutely, absolutely. It, 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 that's an excellent point. I know you know, I'm guilty of that myself. Something that um, comes very easily to me, I'm thinking, oh, what's the big deal? But that that is really your gift. If it comes that easily to you, that's your gift, and that is what you are here to share. So, you know, my meeting women, um, you know, it's very easy for me, and I know there. I've talked to other women who are saying, "Oh, I could never put myself out there," you know, and I'm. It's not hard, <laughs> and it's just, you know, you talk to somebody at the grocery store, you talk to somebody at the PTA. You just start conversations, and you never know where that's going to lead. Yeah, and, and to take it with the attitude, what can I do for them? Instead of worrying about what you have to say about yourself, what can I do for them? That just changes the dynamic instantly. And, and of course, you're right. Talk to everybody. I still remember this great story of a friend of mine who's, they had a birthday party for their kid, and her husband was trying to raise some venture capital for his company. And after the, the, the event, he, they were on the way home, and she said, oh, did you talk to Aileen? And he said, well, yeah. I sp well, she said, you know she's a venture capitalist, right? And he said, oh, I was at a birthday party. You know? Oh, no, <laughs> he was yeah. You're everywhere you are around you is somebody who can help you, but not if you think you're at a birthday party. Absolutely. Oh, that's a very good example. So how did you um, meet up with these friends to start these other organizations? I am I'm a groupie. <laughs> I think that's what I call myself. I join a lot of groups. So when I think about uh, the different groups that I have started have always been coming together with other women from other uh, networks that I'm a part of. So the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs actually started out of Stanford Business School. I went to business school when I was 31 and when I was at school I was in a women's community there and it was actually several other women from that community who started, who came together to start the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs. And then uh, Springboard came about because we got a call one day from a woman who said, you know, we want to do this venture conference in California, and we talk to everybody out there, and they say you're the one to you're the group to partner with, and are you interested? And and I said yes, and I think there's another lesson. You know, it took me about three minutes to say yes, and it was take a breath and leap, and and that is so much the way I've lived my life. Say yes. It, who knows? You you don't know what it's going to be like, and it was a lot of hard work, but it was you know not something I ever regret. And then I started a women's leadership company called Invent Your Future, and and that came about because I ran into a friend of mine at a at a cocktail party, and I said, you know, I think we. We don't have a women's conference on the peninsula. Don't you think we need one? And she said, I've been thinking the same thing. And, you know, we started the conference. It's now in its seventh year. So it's always, for me, it starts with a couple of conversations. It starts with people approaching me or me approaching them and having a shared interest in making a difference. Absolutely. Excellent. So, you know, I talk about uh, the superb, superb women are women who are comfortable in their own skin, who have, as I said, taken the time to understand what's important to them. But the other thing I talk about are shoulds. Shoulds contain guilt. And superb women um, have learned to kind of shed some shoulds. Um, so what's a should that, that you have learned to let go of? Well, I think my assistant would tell you I have some shoulds I should still look to. Look to <laughs> We all do. We all do. We all do. We're all a work in progress, right? Exactly. But I think the main good is actually my weekends. And I, because I run so fast during the week, I also tried to used to pack my weekends full as well and try to do everything with everybody. And so I had to just say, no, it's okay that sometimes I need to go from 60 to zero on the weekend and just stop and just renew and relax and, and watch a movie or a dumb TV show, whatever it is that sort of slows my brain down a little. So that should was, was and I'm not perfect again. I'm, I'm, we're all approaching perfection. That'll, I'm sure that'll happen someday when I'm a hundred. But this, you know, trying to get my weekends down to a dull roar is a really key, critical part of my survival strategies. Mm -hmm. So that's that's your work-life balance then, is, is, is kind of drawing the line there, having that boundary. Yes, and I think the other is I cut back on my boards. Uh, I, I'm involved in tons of different things, but the the actual board seats that I take are few. 
and I am very strategic about them and that is and I don't take another until I've turned out of the first one because it is easy to fritter away time in an ineffective way for these organizations because I don't have, I'm, I'm constantly trying to fit them in rather than actually giving them the concerted time and energy that they deserve. Excellent. That's very good advice. Yeah, so be strategic in what you do, in everything I, you do. Yeah, highest and best use is what I tell my clients. Is this your highest and best use, or is there somebody else who could be doing this, whether it's your employee, there's somebody else on your team who could be doing it, or is there someone else across your company who could be doing it? Is there somebody who is just better and more talented at this, and you're, you've got it on your plate just because you feel like you should, or you feel like, you know, I'm faster or better, or whatever. Well, still, is it your highest and best use? Is it the where you really should be playing? Most of the time, we don't. We have a lot of stuff on our plate that isn't, and the more we can be ruthless about finding those places, the better. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I I have so enjoyed hearing um, more about your life, Denise. You are, you know, there's another quality that that I notice with you, and that is that you are aware, that you are very. Um, observant of what's going on around you. I mean, that's how you got to where you are today. You you took advantage of situations because you were aware of them, and I think that's a really important quality. Are you finding that in people that you work with as well? Yeah, I think that it's very easy to put our head down and work on our to-do list. And over my career, what I've realized is the more we are out talking to different kinds of people, reading different things, learning professional development programs, webinars, whatever, the more we are more effective in every job that we have. You know, it's it is those serendipitous connections that allow us to be more influential, to be more useful to our clients or in our work. So it is. I think you're right. Awareness is a good word for it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what's next? What have you got coming up? Well, I had this amazing email a few weeks ago. I, I, it just these magical things happen in our lives, and I, it's hard work, of course, that leads to magical things, but I, I wrote the book, uh, Ready to Be a Thought Leader. It came out last January. I ran all over the country last year, or took every opportunity to share the story of thought leadership and why it matters. And then in January of this year, I get an email from a gentleman at the Stanford Business School, and he said, I've been tearing through your book, and I love it, and I think you should come and teach at Stanford about this idea. And I thought, wow. wow love to do that. So we're putting a proposal together and uh, going to try to teach that in in the fall or the spring of next year and to put a, actually to be able to teach a course at my alma mater about the things that I care most about. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, that's fabulous. Congratulations. Thank you. And we're going to do an online piece because I really think that that's critical. Students really care about thought leadership, but many of them are not quite ready yet, whereas the alumni, I think, really are. And so trying to create this online piece and, and also create then a version that I can share more broadly to the public, that's the other piece of what I want to work on in the next year. So taking this content online and teaching it in a way that is kind of broken up in a blueprint fashion, step by step, here's how you do it, here's how you can make a difference in your com company, your community, your industry. That's that's what I'm all about. That sounds great. I think that makes a lot of good sense. Wow, well, we'll look forward to, to um, hearing more about that, and I'm sure you'll have stuff up on your website about that, correct? Yes, absolutely. Excellent. And just um, to inform people, what is your website again? You'll see it in the slide, but tell us what it is. Sure, it's thoughtleadershiplab.com. Excellent. Any closing thoughts here, Denise, before we wrap things up? Well, I, I am honored to be a superb woman, and I really thank you for including me. I think what you're doing is right. You're creating this 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 role model community for others to connect with, and that's what it's all about. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for being one of those role models. So thanks. Um, so that's our show tonight. Next week, join us. We have another great show. Rosanna, uh, I have to look at my notes here because I'm going to mess up her name. Rosanna Figara, who is with Waffles and Dingus. Now, if you're in the New York area, and I think they've got more um, locations otherwhere, other places, but they started with a food truck, which was voted the number one food truck in the country. And now they have um, little stores all over New York City, and they've got um, a location um, downtown. 
that's just part of her story, though. This wonderful, delicious waffles. Um, but she, wait till you hear her story. She was actually an ambassador from Venezuela. So we're going to hear all about her story next week on Superb Woman Sundays at 7. Until then, have just a fabulous week.